more love, more joy, everything. It's inspired young people. Inspiration comes from within you. When you clear out the garbage that's in your mind, you then create space for something better, more beautiful to come in. Let's have life and have it more abundantly. I say yes. It's like taking a workshop. I get to be in my pajamas. We have a very active imagination, which is why it's important to learn how to harness it and then point it in the direction you want to go. I listen to your show every day. It's time now for Living Your Inspired Life with Susan Burrell. Susan is no-nonsense, inspirational, motivational, and fun. This is positive talk radio. Practical wisdom for everyday life. It's a gift you give yourself. Now, here's Susan. And welcome to Living Your Inspired Life. You're listening to News Talk 1590 KVTA. And just at the get-go, I'm going to let everybody know that if you miss anything or you tune in, you tune in early or you tune in late or at any time during your week, you can go to livingyourinspiredlife.org and listen to uh, some amazing shows, amazing people that we're having conversations with that are doing like leading edge, leading thought uh, sustainable and green things around the country. And uh, the work is just fabulous. So it's livingyourinspiredlife.org where you can tune in, tune up, and develop your power perspective. So with that said, I have been given this amazing gift. Uh, and again, like I say all the time, I'm just grateful for the work I get to do and, and the people I get to have conversations with. So I was given this amazing gift of this really fun, uh, fantasy thriller about superheroes and I'm a superhero kind of geek I've seen a lot of the superhero movies especially the current ones and so this one came across my email and it is called the super yogi scenario and the author is James Connor James welcome to the show happy to be here so uh, I was caught by the title super yogi super yogi scenario and you're this the story is about uh superheroes that develop amazing powers well they're kind of typical superhero powers in some ways but by by becoming yogis and studying the yoga sutra and and following the path of buddhism right well that's accurate it, it is a mix of yoga sutra which is traditionally hindu but also there's buddhist text mm -hmm. in it so as you're saying, Susan, the super yogi scenario is a new take on the superhero story. Instead of supernatural powers coming from lab mishaps or mm -hmm. spider bites, uh, powers come from yoga and meditation, as precisely described in the Yoga Sutra and Buddhist texts from the early centuries. So let me ask you this, James. First of all, for, for my listeners that don't know anything about yoga or have a Western experience of yoga, which kind of then to me circles back to you don't really know much about yoga. Could you explain to our listeners what a yogi is and what yoga really is? Sure. So the term yogi is normally used for people that pursue the higher levels of meditation, whether it's in a yoga lineage tradition, a Hindu tradition, or the higher levels of a Buddhist tradition. There are people that go off and do long meditation retreats. And what you find when you look at, like, the Yoga Sutra, which is sort of the root text for all the yoga lineages, it was written in the 3rd century by Master Patanjali. It presents the yogic path to enlightenment as a path of meditation. And the physical asana poses that we all know and love so much, they were intended to help prepare the body in order to sit comfortably in meditation. And having undertaken a three-year meditation retreat myself, wow. I, <laughs> I can say that I couldn't have done it without the physical yoga poses because it kept my body healthy and happy. Um, so I'm very excited that the physical yoga spreading throughout the world. And I think people are ready to now explore the higher levels of yoga, the higher levels of meditation. And hopefully a text like the Super Yogi scenario, even though it's a page-turning thriller, 
will inspire people to go a little bit deeper in their yoga practice. So it, it, it does. There's It's chock full of um, sacred text and information. And, and I, you know, and I just have to tell people out there, if you're going to a yoga studio and, um, okay, I'll just talk from my experience, James. When I have gone to some yoga studios, the, a lot of the yoga teachers are leading you through the poses as if you're doing calisthenics. And for me, when I started doing yoga years ago, it was to really develop my meditation practice and support my health. And I don't know that a lot of people get that that is more, uh, okay, it's my opinion, people, it's more beneficial to find a yoga place where you are being uh, encouraged to develop your meditation practice and your the health of your body. The nice thing is that people are sensing that there's something more to these physical poses. So I think it's okay to come to it from more of a physical outside. It does have remarkable effects on the heart and the mind, and it does settle you. But eventually people are going to realize we need to explore the higher limbs of yoga. You know, classically, there are eight limbs of yoga, and the physical poses are only the third limb of yoga. So that was something I wanted to do with the Super Yogi scenario. Inside of a thrilling narrative, kind of start to expose people to the higher limbs to get them excited about going deeper. Okay, so if, if uh, the poses are the third limb, what are the first two that lead to that? The first limb is called the yamas. And the yamas are things that you shouldn't do, like harming other people. That's going to hurt your yoga practice. So keeping your morality really pure, first limb of yoga. The second limb of yoga is called the niyamas. And the niyamas are all about starting to do things that help you to collect virtue, like serving other people, uh, like starting to study philosophical texts and higher views of reality. Then you're prepared, you're charged to do the physical asana poses. That's the third limb. And that prepares you to then sit. The fourth limb of yoga is pranayama, just focusing on the breath, stilling the mind. We're starting to move from a process of more outward activities inward. Then you get to pratyahara. And pratyahara is all about withdrawing the sense consciousness, withdrawing from the world and going even more internal. Then you get to the next limb of yoga, which is dharana, which is focusing on your meditation object, followed by dhyana, fixating on your object, and samadhi, which is perfect meditation. I think one of the things to say that's also very important about the yoga tradition and the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is focusing on the breath and meditation is only a preliminary. Focusing on the deeper nature of reality is what both those traditions start to move to. Right. And again, that's something I wanted to inspire people with, with the Super Yogi scenario. Which, so, uh, so I've been reading this uh, novel, The Super Yogi Scenario, James, and, um, and it's really fun. It's really fun. And because I have done some studies in these areas, I was immediately picking up on things. I was reading it with a, a friend of mine. And, you know, and I kept saying to him, are you, are you comprehending? Did you get that? Do you know what that means? And he's like, no, I don't really know what that means, but it's very interesting. So, uh, so it was, it's, it's very fun people, the super, super yogi scenario, because, um, you're making it interesting by, uh, having these superheroes that are not about, well, there has to be a villain in, in every, in every good book. Of course. But the, but really these people are about what you were talking about, about practicing, a higher morality of harming none and being of service and and then also not necessarily getting triggered by people they uh i want to say don't like but people that are trying to you know prick them and and make them uh angry or upset or shame and blame them and and it it's a really great uh illustration 
of how we can manage that in our lives. You know, the whole the whole thing that I did with the Super Yogi scenario is, is like yourself, I've studied for many years. I studied these texts uh, for 12 years before I undertook a three-year meditation retreat. And then I had more time to sit with them. But if you look at like a text like the Yoga Sutra, it's divided into four chapters. You know, the first chapter is why you need to meditate. The next chapter is practices that support good meditation. And then the third chapter is the chapter on mystic powers. And it's all about these supernatural abilities that start to emerge at the higher limbs of yoga. And then the fourth chapter says, but don't get stuck there. You know, so it sounds like there's, a, a, there's more to do that just didn't get written in the book. Well, in the, in the fourth chapter, they talk about go on to eliminate all negativity. Go on to be service to all beings. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do with the Super Yogi scenario was basically like a modern take on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, where it could be an experiential tale of how ordinary people can develop their unique talents and abilities. They will be faced with temptation. Do they use their powers in selfish ways, or do they use their powers to serve others? And then the story is ultimately about how do we become heroes ourselves, and how can we make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. So I get that your uh, desire and intention in writing the yogi, the super yogi scenario, James, was to, um, in essence, gift these ancient principles and texts out into a larger world, especially a Western culture, which I think we kind of operate in almost a different, well, we operate in a different way than that, but the idea of, of uh, we're kind of a war-based culture, and the idea of, you know, getting those people, be, because they hurt us, so we're going to do the eye for an eye thing, is very fundamental to our culture. And we're seeing it play out right now in the, in the, in the uh, news. It's absolutely something that we must address. And there's a beautiful verse in the Yoga Sutra. It's in the second chapter. Mm -hmm. It says, if you make it a way of life, never to hurt others, then in your presence, all conflict comes to an end. Say that again, James. If you make it a way of life, never to hurt others, then in your presence, all conflict comes to an end. So that says to me, if I practice this, well, and I actually do, uh, then I will begin to see in my external world uh, people doing good things with each other and to each other and not running into a lot of negativity. And I think, honestly, we're starting to see a beautiful shift in our culture. And, and on one end of it is why is our culture suddenly obsessed with superhero stories in the movie, mm -hmm. at TV, and the graphic novels? And I think it has everything to do with as we become more connected to the struggle of people across the planet, we want to see good triumph over evil. Right. And we want to see suffering lessened. And so we have this call for this archetype, for this hero to arise. And heroes, they put other people's needs first. And we want to see that and want to be that. But right now, it just looks like you have to be a billionaire with access to cool tech or from another planet or in a lab mishap to become a real superhero. So the main so the the main superhero in Super Yogi scenario his name is Eric and um and he was saying I qu I wrote it down he's saying that uh there is a place of interdependence and he's talking about how he learned his superhero power which I'm going to tell I'm not going to tell everybody everybody. You you can you can tell. Okay. So his superpower here uh superpower is to be able to read minds which in, in, in it sounds like to me correct me if I'm wrong James that he's actually able to become one with uh, with individuals and really hear and also maybe feel what they're 
angst is, you know, what's going on inside of them, and it, inf- and it, and it informs him of what is going on in their mind. You're correct. And here's the interesting thing. The, the Yoga Sutra, there's like 18 verses that explain in detail how different supernormal power de- powers are developed. Mm-hmm. And there is the instruction, with the necessary cause, one can read the minds of others. Well, what exactly is the necessary cause? It's to realize that interdependence between how you perceive an event and your own mind. And all of the yogic supernormal powers share this one piece of wisdom, that the world is not coming at us. It's coming from how we treat others. That's f- that, you know, it's so interesting because in my own personal meditation, I've been leaning into that without realizing it. And then when I read it in your book, I was like, that's it. That this whole idea of serving first, serving others without atta- without attachment of what am I going to get out of it is, is to me is the key right now. It absolutely is. It's the key to all sincere spiritual practice. So let me quote uh, Eric from your your novel, A Super Yogi Scenario, and he and he's talking about interdependence and, and kind of how he learned to read minds. And he, and he said, in the way was interdependence. I had to learn how to change by taking care of others instead of worrying about myself. Hello? How many people? That, everybody's tied up in worrying about themselves. That's like they're, you, wait, you cannot wake up without worrying about yourself for some people. <laughs> right? And then, and then he goes on to say, to go beyond ordinary, you have to lose yourself in serving others. Then you can become what others truly need. Okay, so what did you mean by that? Then you can become what others truly need. In order to become someone extraordinary, in order for these characters to evolve, as you see in the book, they have to get their small, ordinary self mm. out of the way. Mm-hmm. We all have profoundly limiting beliefs about what we're capable of. And the only way to get past our limiting beliefs is to focus on others and be what they need. Then we can do extraordinary things. So I want to quote something that's, uh, I I believe it's from the Karma Sutra. It's one of those, you know, under the Sanskrit writing. So I'm assuming that's Karma Sutra. Uh, I mean, the Yoga Sutra. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and and this caught my attention. And it kind of speaks to uh, what creates belief systems. It, it says, there is a connection of cause and effect. The seeds ripen into experience, in experiences refreshing, refreshingly pleasant or painful in their torment, depending on whether you have done good to others or done them wrong instead. So our action of doing good comes back to us. Absolutely. And this is the main piece of wisdom that you're going to see in all the yogic traditions. You're going to see it in all the Buddhist traditions. You're going to see Jesus constantly teaching cause and effect. Mm -hmm. He says things like, you can't get figs from thorns. Never understood that. It's cause and effect. He says, put down your sword. Everyone who uses a sword will be killed by a sword. And what this means is if you do a good deed, it plants a seed. And that seed will ripen in something pleasant. Good deeds create good results always. There is a time lag. All we have to know is what the farmers know. You know, no farmer believes that they're going to plant watermelon seeds and get corn. Right. You know, bad deeds will create bad results. Always. Always. And this is the main teaching. This is this incredible wisdom teaching. All we have to know is how to be good gardeners, how to be good farmers. Every action you do is a wish for your world. Every thought is a wish for your world. So just think about what you want and be that for your world. 
you will plant those seeds, there will be a time lag, but they will ripen and experience it refreshingly pleasant or so, painful in their torment, depending on whether you have done good to others or done them wrong instead. Makes sense to me, James. Complete it, sense. It is the wisdom that can help us transform the world. You know, the thing that I love about this is you've taken very ancient texts that were... <clears throat> The Yoga Sutra was written way before. It was ri it was written before Buddha was even in existence. Yes. Well, um, the Buddhist teachings and and the Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha, you're looking at 500 BC. Mm -hmm. um, so, the Yoga Sutra is third century, almost 800 years later. Later, and okay. Scholars scholars agree that Master Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is a mix of Buddhist philosophy, pre-Samkhya Hindu philosophy, which didn't really harden until like the 7th century, mm -hmm. and the general Indic meditation culture. It is a profoundly sort of, uh, it's just a wisdom text that doesn't really belong to any sectarian lineage. It's an extraordinary text. So it was great to pull from because it really represents these traditions. But you'll see the echoes throughout any wisdom teachers in any any religion. So uh, your character, Eric, I, I want to just circle back to this um, planting a seed of, of doing good. And he says, uh, he, he's telling this other character who's de developing her flying superpower, Ariel, and he says to her, here's the secret of interdependence. You take your good deeds and map them to what you want. You consciously create your future. You take your good deeds to that place of pure potential in deep meditation and create a new reality. Now, can we tease this out a little bit for our listeners? Because um, the idea of that your good deeds are the seeds that are going to create your reality, right? But why do I have to meditate about that, James? Why do I have to, why do I have to go into Susan, deep I meditation? I absolutely love that you're going at this. <laughs> so let, let's do it. All right. Okay? okay. So let's just start. We'll move in steps. The first thing we have to prove is that there is an inter interdependence between our mind and how we experience the world. So I'm just going to ask you to do a little thought experiment and your listeners to do it as well. Mm -hmm. I want you to picture someone who you love and think, has wonderful qualities. Okay. Got it. Does everyone in the world see them the same way? Ha, huh, no. In a heartbeat, just by looking at that, you can see that you have a unique experience of them. Other people are neutral towards them. Some people maybe even have conflict with them. Mm -hmm. But your experience of that person is unique to you. Mm-hmm. Seeing that in meditation is quite profound and quite powerful because you really catch your mind doing it. And what you realize is there may be an outside person out there, but I never see them. I only see my person. And you realize I have certain causes in my heart that cause me to experience that person in a loving, wonderful way. And every object in the world is like that. Whether we're talking about a song, you know, some person loves a song, another doesn't. The song doesn't exist in one way. It depends upon perspective. Okay. So our experience in our world, our inner world, also is about perspective. Absolutely. And this is the punchline of quantum physics. Okay, let's go to quantum physics, James. Let's go. We've been giving Nobel Prizes away for people who articulate this philosophy that there is no objective reality. It is always based on an observer. And the classic quantum, uh, quantum physics experiment is the conundrum of wave-particle duality. Right. Explain every that to our listeners. Sure. Every particle in the universe, it, it manifests as a wave 
like a ripple on a pond, pure potential, if you measure it as a wave. But if you measure it as a particle, it performs like a particle. And the quantum physicists are kind of confused because it's like, well, which one is it? And then they realize it's not anything without an observer. There is an interdependence, and that is the punchline of quantum physics. It's the same with our world. There may be an object out there, but you can never find it. You only experience your object. So that being the case, once you become grounded in that wisdom, and there's lots of great meditative techniques to do that, and uh, my partner and I, Kristen Walsh, we created a website, a nonprofit, gobeyond.org, which teaches people how to meditate from authentic scriptural sources from the last 25 centuries so they can catch this wisdom for themselves. But once you see that, then you realize it would be possible to put causes in my heart that allow me to only experience happiness and bliss in every person I see. Okay, now I want to tap on that, James, because now what you what I heard you just say is I can put a cause in my heart during my meditation practice or intentionally, right? That I can change, I can experience happiness and bliss about or with people that I really don't like. <laughs> is that what you just said? That is what I just said. Let me go further. Okay, please, because I got somebody. You want me to <laughs> do that one okay. too? I got somebody. Okay, but, but you take that person that you have a conflict with. Mm -hmm. Does everybody see them the same way? Okay, that's the thing that upsets me. No, they don't. And they should see that person the way I see that person, James. <laughs> please. But every thought you have is a wish for your world. And now watch what those seeds do. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> do you want me, do you want me <laughs> to push Yes, go on ahead. I gave you permission. Okay. And this is to help all of us because we all have divisions in our world that we need to, hear, to heal. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you have a conflict with somebody and then you try to convince other people to have a conflict with them as well, creating division oh, where yeah. maybe there wasn't division, that is your wish for the world, that there would be more division. And the universe kind of listens and say, well, you must love division, so let me divide you from people. And then it turns back on you. And so divisive speech is, is one of the great uh, obstacles that we have in the world currently, that we have to learn how to heal. But you'll never be able to do it until you realize that it has something to do with your own mind. Yeah, and it and it's not so. It, it, it is. You can even like have the practice of not running around telling the story, the bad story about the person you think is bad. You can just even just think those things without saying it out loud, and you're still causing that effect. Absolutely. They, this is this is the meaning of the word karma. Karma, the definition of it, classical definition movement of the mind and what it inspires wow say that again karma is the movement of the mind and what it inspires and what they mean by that is in every thought you have you have a recorder in your mind that plants that little energetic potential that little seed they call it a sanskara and that seed will eventually ripen in something similar to what mental image you put in there. So James, uh, so I'm uh, so again, I'm wrapping my mind around what we what we're talking about here. And so if I begin to notice that I'm having a, a an uts, a, a negative experience about a human being, do I have to then like take myself to a, a, a cushion and sit down and meditate about it? Or is there something that I can do where I can drop in 
Well, first of all, if I'm getting if I'm getting oats by somebody, if I'm up, if I'm getting angry, upset, or jealous or fearful about somebody, that's like the red flag, right? Going, hello, pay attention to this. It's not them; it's you. <laughs> is that right? It is right. And, and what I can tell you quite sincerely is, I ran a business for 14 years in New York City, and one of my teachers told me. Don't go outside without meditating first, mm-hmm. because you're just going to be a fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, somebody's going to push your button, and you're going to react to it, mm-hmm. and it will create its own little mini cycle of suffering. And so, condition your mind to wisdom. And to how you want the world to be, even for just fifteen minutes a day, and watch how those seeds have their own momentum. And what I can say to people sincerely is, if you meditate on love and compassion for all beings every day for fifteen minutes, your outlook will shift. And when that person is pushing your button, you'll just be able to look at them and say. They just want to be happy, and they don't know how to get it. Yeah, I don't have to add a drop to their ocean of pain. Well, you know, as you're saying that, James, I'm also hearing that then I got to also have this uh, place in my heart and mind where I can forgive that person. That was something that I learned very much uh, in a three-year retreat. What I can tell people honestly is you can't get to the higher levels of meditation if you have any resentment or anger in your heart. Oh, brother. <laughs> you have to forgive. Uh. You have to let go. And, and it just made me so appreciate all of Jesus' teaching. Mm-hmm. You know, that was his main message. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Forgive. Because we're all interconnected. Correct. And, and I can tell you, there is nothing better than when you get to true meditative stillness. It's better than anything the modern world can offer when you're no longer pushed around by the thoughts in your mind, when you can just be at peace and have love for everyone in your heart. That is a treasure you can tap into wherever you go. James, uh, we're going to take a short break. I'm speaking with James Connor, the author of the novel, which is a great novel, The Super Yogi Scenario. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to Living Your Inspired Life, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Susan Burrell from Living Your Inspired Life. I always find it easier and more fun to expand my life by being connected to open-hearted, like-minded people committed to being on the same path I am. If you feel the same way, I suggest you visit a Center for Spiritual Living. There are wonderful communities in Ventura, Ojai, Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Pleasant Valley, Camarillo, and Westlake Village. You'll find terrific people, great information, and more tools to help you live the life you were born to live. So go to CSL.org to find a center near you. That's CSL.org for a center near you. Welcome back to Living Your Inspired Life. I'm Susan Burrell, and I'm having a conversation with author and yogi, or yogi and author, James Conner, who's written this great novel, and it's about superheroes, and it's called The Super Yogi Scenario. Now, James, before you were a yogi, or or maybe while you were becoming one, or, or something like that, and before you really wrote these books, you worked at a, at a really prominent business in uh, New York City. That's correct. So wha- so you were there doing that. So you're doing your thing on whatever, Madison Avenue, Wall Street. I, I'm from Southern California. <laughs> but wh- So what called you then to just like not do business and go on a three-year yogi retreat? Well, it's true. I did own an advertising agency in New York for 14 years. And during that time, I was a student. You know, I was studying with heavyweight Buddhist mamas and gurus in the Shivananda lineage. 
And I would meditate every day before I went to work. And I would meditate on what do my employees need? What would make their life better today? And I would meditate on the clients I was going to see. What's really the problems that they need solved? What would make their lives better? And I found my mind and my heart becoming so clear, I could solve problems so quickly. And so a new thought started to emerge. How far could an ordinary Westerner go if they devoted themselves fully to the path of meditation? And so after 12 years of training, I wanted to be a spiritual test pilot. And I had the opportunity to sell my business, and I did. And I chose to give away most of the money to different charities. And then I undertook this 1,000-day meditation retreat. Okay. And what does that look like? Because i got to tell you, three years of doing meditation, were you meditating like 24-7? One of the wonderful things about it is I was in a isolated cabin in uh, the desert mountains of Arizona uh, near the border of Mexico. And I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have internet. I didn't have any news of the outside world mm, mm-hmm. for three years. Wow. That that's actually sounds pretty sweet to me. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I, it was amazing how, how wonderful that was. And um, all I had was these ancient meditation texts and a lot of time to study them and meditate on them and meditate for many, many hours every day and do yoga. And on Sundays, I would take a break. Uh, the advice when you do over a thousand days of retreat is take one day a week off. And so on Saturday nights, I wouldn't get up for the 2 a.m. session. I would sleep through the night and still do a morning session. But then in the afternoon, I wrote the Super Yogi scenario. So this particular book comes from a very deep place, and I wanted it to be a page turner and be fun, but there's some really deep stuff in the book. There is. It's 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 one of those that I kind of would encourage people to read all the way through quickly and then go back and really soak in the the mm-hmm. wisdoms that's there because um and I've been plotting through it because I, I get caught and I'm like, oh, I got to sit down and think about that. Wait a minute. That's cool <laughs> because of the information that's in it. So, you know, I, so I do have to say, James, uh, when I started reading this, uh, I was I started to become a little concerned because um, the idea of developing superpowers, which, OK, I was I was talking to my son about this. He goes, have you ever met anybody that's developed a superpower mom? I'm like, not in this lifetime, but I totally get that it's possible. I really do get that it's possible through this practice. But I got concerned that uh, you're giving out some sacred information in a, in a form that a lot of people are going to read for fun. But there will be people that, uh, my concern, James, I'll just be straight up with you. My concern is that you're putting out sacred information on how to develop these powers that might fall into the wrong hands. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of people that are out. Well, I, I'm concerned about the people that haven't done the inner work to go and it harms none. It's beautiful. I love what you're saying. And, and obviously the main message of the book is it's not powers that make someone super. It's putting other people first. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. When you look at these ancient meditation texts, when they talk about the supernormal ability, they're always accompanied by warnings. Are you going to use this to serve others? Or are you going to use this for your own selfish purposes? And it is a tension when supernormal abilities start to emerge. They talk about it being a tension for a yogi at that stage. A tension in terms of you're talking like a really tightly strung thing or attention, what you're putting your attention on? It's a tension in that it is a very confusing time period uh, in which yeah. if there are mental afflictions present, mm-hmm. there is a proclivity towards abusing them. Uh-huh. 
I get and, that. And when you look historically at the text and at the stories, there's always examples of people that use them, sort of went to the dark side. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at the powers that they're talking about, the eight traditional yogic powers, if you took a yogi from the third century and you brought them to our world today, they would think nearly everyone already has supernormal ability. Really? Let me be, let me be a little more clear. They talk about the skywalking power, being mm -hmm. able to fly from one continent to another. Mm -hmm. We can do that. They talk about the power of clairvoyance, to being able to hear a conversation on the other side of the globe. Mm -hmm. We're doing that now. They talk about swift feet, being able to travel over land at fast speed. So the things that are manifesting in our world to a yogi from the third century, they would have thought that was miraculous. And they would immediately ask the next question. Are you using that for selfish purposes? Or are you using it to serve us? And so I think it's a very important debate to actually look at ourselves, look at our own unique powers and abilities, and the opportunities that we have every day on this miraculous planet. Are we working for the good of others, or are we only serving ourselves? You know, and that takes some really uh, deep clarification within. Because I mean, you can begin. You can begin to recognize: Am I doing this be because I I want the gain? I want something out of it, or am I doing this because I really just want to give? Uh, give out to the world but then there becomes like this you know, when you talk about the tension at least I'm this is something I've been uh, experiencing is that and maybe it's releasing myself from my western upbringing but um, that place where it becomes you might think you're doing something uh, with no strings attached just giving and being of service but sometimes uh, you can get tripped up because the ego steps in. Absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and then all of a sudden you can realize, wow, I, I thought I was doing that for, you know, no bennies, but wow, I think I, I, I really am wanting to have the payback. <laughs> it is a tension that we all have that we should all acknowledge. And we will find our happiness and overcoming. So, so just to be clear, James, the, the super yogi scenario and the superpowers that are in there, you are really absolutely in the trust and belief that there will be individuals, that 99% of the individuals that read this will not use these powers for the dark side. The other thing that you have to understand is you have to reach very high levels of meditation okay. to manifest these powers the way they're classically manifested. But the Yoga Sutra, the fourth verse, opens with a statement. Powers can be attained either at birth, through herbs, spells, extreme practices, or through deep meditation. And I want to suggest very much that we are in a world right now we are born into a world that is miraculous. And we're already having to make the choice. Am I going to use this selfishly, or am I going to use this to serve others? It is already a tension that has happened in our world. It is definitely a tension right now. Absolutely. On, on so many levels, if you just look at the socioeconomic things happening in the world or the political stuff that's happening in the world or the wars that are happening in the world. The tension is so tight. The string is so taut that at least for, at least that's my feeling of it when I, when I lean into all that stuff. And so we have to have a clear vision for how is it that we make it better. And that's something I really wanted to do with the Super Yogi scenario 
you know, there's a beautiful verse that's in the book. It comes from Master Shantideva, a great ninth century Buddhist master. And he says, all the happiness in the world comes from taking care of others. All the suffering in the world comes from taking care of yourself. Wow, that just hit me between the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I got to say, my son says this phrase, true that. True that, man, because uh, at least in my experience, that's that's what happens. And it's interesting to watch it in the outer world, in the world of corporate structures that you, that you used to participate in, that it, it is, that's not how a lot of corporations participate in the world at, at all. Well, it's not how a lot of successful corporations participate in the world. That's what a sad James, too. But what I would say is um, when people are having success, Watch how good they are about thinking about other people. Okay. You know, and, and, you know, you can just do simple business examples. Like, um, you know, take Google, who is colossally successful. When you go to Google, all you want to do is search. Mm -hmm. And so all they have is the search bar. Yahoo, who preceded them, They've loaded their home page with all kinds of news and items so they can feed you more ads and such and such and such. You know, they're thinking more, well, we'll get them and we'll be able to feed them all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. But they're not really standing in the customer shoe. Why do you go to a search engine? To search. To search. And I don't and like those pop-up things, man. Yeah, and that's why Google has ascended over all the search engines because they actually understood that customer's desire and the customer's moment, and they made it a cultural priority. Mm -hmm. And you can see that example played out a thousand times of just the people that are best at standing in somebody else's shoes and giving them what they want. Those are the people that win in the world. And it's the only technique that I follow when I write. I think about the reader. What does the reader need? Their, their life is busy. Their life is complicated. How can I give them a special, unique experience? And what do they need to hear to turn the page? And the words just come. So let's talk about some of the superheroes in the super yogi scenario. Happy to. Okay. So the there, first one is, is Eric, who is has developed mind reading powers, and then there's Ariel, who's developing flying abilities. And I love that she. Well, I'm not going to tell you guys. Have to get the book. No, you can tell. <laughs> well, she's a she's an Air Force uh, fighter pli pilot, and and now she's going to learn how to do it without the machine. Which okay, before you go on to the superhero powers. I want to tap back what you said earlier about a yogi from the third century would come to our world now and think it was fascinating because we're already doing those things. And what I kept hearing as you were saying that is, yeah, but we're doing it with mechanics. We're doing it with outer outer forms that support us in doing that, like a cell phone and a car and an airplane. But truly, 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 we can learn to do these things because of interdependence without all that mishigash, right? <laughs> it's very much like that, and it's so tricky. Because let, let, let's just do another thought experiment for all a right. second. I'm your guinea okay. pig. Go, James. Okay. Uh, in your studio, do you have a pen? Mm-hmm. Hold that object up. All right, I'm holding it. You see it as a pen. Yes. If a puppy dog were to come in your studio or your home, what would they see it as? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. A chew toy. A chew toy. And they wouldn't see it as a pen. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't write you a note with it. They would see it as something to chew on. And they wouldn't even have the concept of pen. Now, you say that's dog and that's human. Right. But take, take the cap off your pen. Uh-huh. What if you were to throw that on the floor of cell block 13? In a prison someplace. Yeah. What What could it be? Something to hurt somebody with. Could be a shiv. Mm -hmm. And what you see is with this blank screen, 
depending on what seeds you have in your heart, you conceptualize it as a pen and it functions like a pen. Or you conceive it as a chew toy and it functions like a chew toy. Or you conceive of it as a weapon and it functions as a weapon. That interdependence. And what I want to suggest very strongly and what the wisdom of the Yoga Sutra and other Buddhist texts suggest is the world is essentially a blank screen and it's consciousness taking form. It functions perfectly. Already. And so, already. And so the fact that we are able to conceive of a device that you could speak into and hear somebody on the other side of the planet, other people who've walked across our planet have never been able to manifest that. That's why I say this world is a miraculous place. Yeah. So, okay, thank you for that sidebar, James. So okay. let's talk about the um, the characters in the book with the superpowers. We've got about five minutes left, and I, I just want you to... Uh, well, the main thing in the story is I wanted to take ordinary people and show how they would get themselves out of the way and start to put new causes in their heart so they could manifest extraordinary abilities because they need to in order to protect others. And so the interesting character arc for Eric is he was a former Navy SEAL yes. who was badly injured in Afghanistan. And to overcome the post-traumatic stress disorder and injuries to his body, like so many vets who were being exposed to yoga and meditation in the VA hospital, he got very serious about yoga and meditation. And being a Navy SEAL, he took it very seriously. And he started to break down that duality between himself and others. And he was able to start to read the minds of others. And because of that, he could start to see the unique, special seeds, the special skills that people have, and help them to refine it. And so he teaches an Air Force pilot how to fly without a machine. He teaches another woman, who's a martial arts expert, to become even stronger. And you'll meet other characters as you move through the book. And so he helps to assemble this team in order to take down yogis who are abusing their powers and threatening the world. We need good guys like that. Absolutely. Yeah, we totally do. So, James, you have... a. Uh, a website called gobeyond.org and I, I went on your website it's awesome it's awesome everybody and if you if you are looking to uh, develop your meditation if you haven't meditated before it looks like it's a really great place to start absolutely um, it's teaching you how to meditate from authentic scriptural sources it's the greatest hits of meditation from the last 25 century <laughs> and there's lots of free meditation modules lots of video teaching, and it's just to support you to develop an authentic daily meditation practice. Yeah. Okay. Now, is it something that I have to go to every day? Um, you can go to it every day to take the free streaming file, or you can uh, make a $25 contribution. It's a nonprofit, and you can download the file. So it's totally up to people. Okay. And that's gobeyond.org. Now, if people want to contact you about your book, what's your website? My website is by James Connor, which is B-Y, James Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R dot com. Dot com. And Go ahead. What I can say to people is um, I made the book available for free through the Kindle Lending Library. I love this idea. It's awesome. So, so if you have Amazon Prime, as so many people do, or you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read the Super Yogi scenario for free, and I encourage you to do that. And pass it on, too. Sure. And the, and the book is also available in a great hardcover that's in Barnes & Noble, and the reviewers are, are very excited about this book. And the graphics are great. <laughs> the graphics <laughs> are really great. I love your graphic artist. You've got to tell that person thank you for me. Yeah, Jeff Chapman is a great comic book artist, and I gave him all my funny little sketches from Retreat. He really brought these characters. Oh, my life. gosh. He's, he did a brilliant job. A brilliant Absolutely. job. 
So the book is called The Super Yogi Scenario. It's a, it is a action-packed novel, people, but there's ancient wisdom in it that, you know, like I said earlier, just read it through once, enjoy the fun, go for the ride, and then go back through and soak up the wisdom because it, it's just right there. James, I am so grateful for you uh, having taken your three-year retreat and doing this work for us. Very kind of you, and I'm, I'm happy to be with you today. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to end by saying, and so it is, namaste.